Have you ever wondered what this is called? I did a little research to find out. Using some of the professional tools that I have at my disposal, like Google and Wikipedia, I found out that its official name is an ellipses, or sometimes it's called ellipses points. Before we really get going, I just want to say that I'm not an expert on this subject, and I cannot guarantee the accuracy of everything. It's just a topic that I'm interested in. If you're interested as well, please leave a like, check out some of the links in the description below, and leave a comment with your thoughts. Ellipses actually derives from the Latin word elaipses, which means leave out or omit, and its purpose is exactly that, to leave out. This is called suggestive punctuation. I'm kidding, I totally made that up so that I could say, no, not suggestive like this. But that does beg the question, if an ellipses wore pants, would it wear them like this? Or like this? An ellipses sort of indicates that we all know what the writer is about to say, so why say it? That's the more creative use of an ellipses, but it can also be used in a quote to show that something has been left out that the adducer didn't see as necessary for their point. But that's enough about. Let's talk about punctuation in general. When was punctuation invented? Has it been around as long as written language? Why does the Spanish language have upside down question marks at the beginning of their sentences? The word punctuation comes from the Latin punctus, which means point, and it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but we're not going to get into that. Punctuation has actually only had its current meaning since the mid-17th century. Before that, it was simply called pointing, and the word punctuation was reserved for what are now called vowel points in the Hebrew and Arabic languages. Punctuation's implementation was initially divided into two schools of thought. The first, the electionary, I mean, um, allocationary, electrocutionary, elocutionary school, which treated periods and stops as pauses of certain lengths that might be observed by someone reading it aloud versus the syntactic school, which used them more as neatly defined concrete guides for sentence structure. These two schools duked it out for a while with syntactic writings like Francis Bacon's 1625 Essays, not pronouncing that right, and elocutionist writings like Paul Bunyan's 1678 Pilgrim's Progress. But in the end, the syntactic school would win the war and become the standard used by angry redditors to correct people in comment sections around the globe. So we know when it got its modern name, but when was punctuation actually invented? Well, that's where this guy comes in. Don't recognize him? Well, then you clearly need to brush up on your 3rd century BC librarians, because this is none other than Aristophanes. Actually, Aristophanes would have been primarily known for his work in writing ancient Greek comedies, but he leaves his legacy by his pioneering of what eventually became punctuation. Before he came along, sentences were written in an unbroken stream of characters that would likely have to be practiced over and over again by the writer before most likely being read aloud in front of a crowd of people. It's no wonder the average peasant and layman of historical civilization wasn't able to read. One look at something like this, and anyone without a doctorate in reading a whole scroll without breathing or blinking or losing your place would walk away crying. Aristophanes, being the chief of staff at the Library of Alexandria, was quoted as saying, No. He'd had enough, and decided to invent the comma, colon, and periodos. These were essentially all just periods set at different heights. These subordinate, intermediate, and full points were designed to separate written language into more easily readable discourse. Unfortunately, when the Romans took control, they decided they didn't like the change and chose to get rid of them once again. In fact, Cicero, whom you may have heard of, was quoted as saying that the end of a sentence ought not to be determined by the speaker's pausing for breath, or by a stroke interposed by a copyist, but by the constraint of the rhythm. Nevertheless, the seeds of punctuation were planted, and eventually, it even tried to find a home in the loam of Rome, where they experimented with separating words with dots. Here's a good example of this practice in Trajan's column. Eventually, that idea also got evicted from its insulae. Punctuation really started taking off with the importance of literature in Christianity and the preservation of meaning in the text, and the subordinate, intermediate, and full pauses were reintroduced to the page. But the positions actually made sense now. Since then, language has evolved in many ways, with the addition of question marks, exclamation marks, parentheses, brackets, slashes, dashes, and hashes. From the rhetorical question marks in the 1580s, to the Spanish upside down question marks in the 1750s, to the therefore symbol, which is used in math as well as informal writings, which I couldn't actually find the official term for. But if I mentioned every punctuation mark and literary symbol and their purpose, we would be here all day. So here are just a few facts that I found particularly interesting. The exclamation mark was supposedly invented in the 14th century by Italian poet Iacopo Alpileo de Urbisaglia. This symbol was meant to be used at the end of an exclamatory question, such as WHAT? and is called an interrobang. <coughs> what we call the at symbol has many different names in other languages. In the Netherlands, it's called a monkey's tail. In Israel, a strudel. In Russia, a little dog. Italy calls it a small snail. And in Bosnia, it's called a crazy A. This symbol is called a pilcrow and is used to mark the beginning of a paragraph. This one is called Dividus Betwixtius. No, not really. It's actually called an obelisk, which you probably know as the divide symbol. 
Here we have Virgul or Solidus, Octothorpe, and Circumflex. It may interest you to know that mid to late 1900s author Kurt Vonnegut hated semicolons. He said his first rule of writing is don't use semicolons. All they do is show you've been to college. Which I kind of see where he's coming from because I have no idea how to use them, but that might be because my sense of inferiority flares up whenever someone explains it to me for the umpteenth time. 16th President of the United States of America, Abraham Lincoln, loved semicolons and said, I must say that I have a great respect for the semicolon. It's a useful little chap. I'll be interested to read the comments and see what your favorite obscure fact about punctuation is. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a chart of all punctuation throughout the history of every language, which someone should really make, but Britannica.com has a lot of useful information regarding the subject. I'll leave a link to it and some of my other information sources in the description below. Through my research for this video, I learned a lot more about how and why language, both spoken and written, evolves over time. It changes with circumstance, purpose, culture. It never stops changing because we never stop changing. Hopefully you learned something as well. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed. Click the bell to learn with me, and comment what you want to learn about next. I'll see you next time.